design stages. Uh, our, our design was based on uh, focus, the main focus of being able to do uh, our aircrafts is able to carry out ground attack missions on targets that are deemed to be too risky to send a manned fighter in, as well as the situations where a cruise missile would be unsuitable. So it also has the, flex, uh, the capability to, uh, to uh, have an active patrol and deterrence missions. Now if I have a look here, this is a, a, a sample mission where with the initial cruise, the cru uh, initial climb to cruise altitude, sorry, where a target is located and confirmed, after which our aircraft will be sent to carry out its missions and then climb back to cruise altitude to be refueled and await further orders. Now our design is split into two sections, namely the cruise, uh, the cruise phase and the attack phase, which will be outlined later on. Now of course there are always issues related to morality and the use of UOVs, and as such, Kratos involved will, uh, will be somewhat guided by these. So as a result of international, uh, international law and uh, legal arguments, our design requires that a human is there to command and confirm the launch of weapons. Now, yeah. so our markets have been chosen to be areas in South America, Indonesia, I don't know if you can see Israel and uh, Japan, but our main market is going to be South Korea. And our main regions of operations are going to be in the, predominantly in the Middle East and the Indian region, as well as North Korea and Taiwan. Now, with all this in mind, our aircraft is designed with two hard specifications, along with a variety of soft specs to it, which focus on the way the aircraft operates. So, as part of its mission profile, the RPPSF has to be, able, has to be highly maneuverable, being able to uh, pull high gears with higher than compared to having a pilot on board. Now, since we plan to have our aircraft, air, our aircraft in the air indefinitely, air aerial fueling will be mandatory. Uh, on top of that, Kratos is designed to have a total of seven hard points to allow for flexibility with weapons. And also, it has to have uh, some sort of self-destruct capability for mission when it goes south, and also able to uh, fly autonomously in the event of communication loss or jam. Now, throughout the design phase, we had come up with a variety of configurations. So the first design there was, uh, was the, wasn't seen as, as very great, because it had too much material, and uh, it was just excess weight. So it was modified into a twin boot design to save weight, with the engine sitting on top. Now, the problem with that is that so the exhaust boom of the engine would be affecting the tail. So it was further modified to have the engine sitting within the fuselage with uh, vertically oriented s ducts for airflow. Now, although this uh, uh, you know, wasn't as efficient for the engine, it made up for it by allowing a more streamlined design with SUA. The problem with this, however, is that the bottom s duct, as you can see, uh, would suffer from foreign object damage or flood from the ground since the clearance wasn't high enough. So as a result of that, we modified our design to be a horizontally aligned s duct as shown in our final design. And we, were, we considered this to be the most effective design. Now, I'll pass on the task, we'll go through the performance of the aircraft. Right, thank you, Joseph. So the first thing to decide, of course, is the aerodynamic performance to ensure the aircraft is flyable. The, the airport was chosen to be the NOC class 64212 at spot angle 25 degrees. It did give good performance at high subsonic speed. The platform area of 17 meters squared is evaluated using the required wing loading of the aircraft for the 12G maneuver. For the CL of the aircraft, for the zero degree flat deflections, the lift coefficient at cruise is approximately 0.2, and at 15 degrees flat deflections, the CO is approximately 1.3. So the aerodynamic performance was assessed using the wind tunnel, CFD, and X plane. Using the X plane, you can see the lift coefficient is in fact a bit lower than what had been projected in the CFD, but at cruising angle of 2 degrees, 3 degrees, the value has been projected by x plane and CFD that uh, with each other. In the wind tunnel, the lift coefficient seems to be higher but still acceptable. But what we have found very intriguing was that the drag was very high from the wind tunnel. And we speculate the source of drag was from the fuse block and engine inlet. And we have undergone a series of modifications on the engine inlet, and Matt will talk about it. Thanks, Taz. So our initial CFD of our scout model did confirm that the fuselage did consider a large amount of drag in addition to the losses within the wind tunnel. So we then did a full-size CFD of our final model, which was correlated against our X-plane and our wing mode CL. CFD was also used to optimize our S-duct design. Obviously, with our S-duct choice, it is vital that the airflow entering the engine from the S-ducts is of clear enough quality so the engine can perform at its specifications as required. The initial design, as you can see there, did have a large area of losses in the upper corner, and at some points there was also some supersonic flow, which was not desirable. As such, we used some CFD simulations to modify the inlet and outlet shape, as well as the general shape of the entire duct, to produce a design that has got far less losses, as you can see there, and no choked flow. 
This is by no means the optimized design for an S-duct, however, it does demonstrate that it is possible to use these S-ducts to get the required mass flow into the engine. Obviously, with our low slung engine, the other key idea was to use our CFT to confirm the exhaust trajectory. Obviously, we wanted to ensure that the exhaust trajectory did not hit the horizontal tail, so we used a CFT simulation to examine where the plume traveled, and we can clearly see it did travel below the uh, main tail. It was noted that part of the outer plume did uh, interact with the horizontal boom. Future work would consider a full thermal analysis of the engine plume and to establish the exact thermal impact from the um, heated engine plume on the horizontal boom and establish whether any protective coating is required on the boom itself. So now we're going to talk about how the tail was designed to meet one of our soft specifications, mainly stability during cruise. Thank you. Uh, the tail design plays an important role to the agility and stability of the aircraft. As the aircraft has to be highly maneuverable, the horizontal tail is designed such that the aircraft process with less longitudinal stability. The vertical tails are designed together with the rotors, for mainly for maximum cross wind and landing. The rotors are designed such that maximum deflections, the rotors are powerful enough to align the aircraft to fly path or to the runway. And now we talked about how did this control service are actually controlled. Um, it comes. Um, I will talk about that system first. So, um, for our initial design, we have cake wraps, but uh, afterward, we change to solid wraps because it has less drag. And for this, we introduce our flat track system. For vacuum system, we allow the flaps to rotate and move outward. And we also uh, install a housing so that it minimizes um, aerodynamic influence and soft waves on the aircraft. Because it gives a higher efficiency at flight and also when flaps are deployed. And I will also talk about control services actuator. So we didn't use for conventional uh, hydro actuator system. We rather use a um, power by wire system. Power by wire is lighter than conventional ones. It gives a faster uh, response in actuation and rotation. It improves in safetyness. Uh, reliability and reliability reason, and we we deal with um, in operating process. So our primary candidate is a uh, electric hydraulic actuation, uh, EH8. So for EH8, we use fluids between uh, electric motors and control service actuators. So the main advantage is it is self-contained uh, within actuator assembly, it independent of aircraft supplies. And the main uh, advantage is that it avoids complication of fit and grant uh, maintenance. So it is a higher choice for uh, our control service actuation. So now I'll pass to Sati to talk about plantation. For the navigation uh, system set of the UFM, various types of systems are uh, chosen to provide aircraft flexibility in order to complete the mission. Space-based satellite navigation systems such as GPS, Rosnet, and Galileo are chosen as a primary system due to their high level of precision and monitoring of the military field. And because the aircraft is tracked from space, it would be able to be maintained in a way that the radio communication is blocked. And for the secondary, uh, secondary system, Taikan and Telecom are chosen. Taikan is a for technical uh, and navigation system. It utilizes the radio wave to provide the aircraft bearing and distance to the ground control. The advantage of this system is that the beacon can be mobile and move around in order to aid the aircraft system to provide the correct line of sight. And for the telecom system, which is the terrain control machine, is used to calculate the aircraft altitude and ground clearance. And the system is very suitable for the RPVSF because it's flexible and independent of other navigation systems, such as uh, when the case that GPS and some satellite are not available in the war scenario. And uh, the RPVSF communications are also provided by the satellite data link, which is able to transmit the information from most part of the world. And I'll pass to Lockman to talk about the location. Yes, just on the navigation systems, these along the other key avionics will be housed in the avionics box, highlighted here in orange. This will be located on the top surface of the fuselage under a fiberglass canopy to limit the amount of EM interference experienced by our satellite uplinks. 
completely different. This we have radar, but we need to add our circum systems and some other, some other key avionic systems. And just behind that, we have our sensor mounted forward facing camera to provide line of sight for our heaviest and primary ordnance. Just behind that, we have the store area for our nose landing gear. And just behind that, we have our S ducts providing the air intake for our engine, which is a modified CFM 5B. This engine will be fed by four quick tanks. Um, two inboard, two outboard, totaling six cubic meters for about 9,600 pounds of fuel. These fuel tanks will be connected by cross feed valves and will be equipped with pumps so the outboard pumps can pump, outboard tanks can pump inboard during flight and the inboard tanks can pump outboard during the aerial refueling process. Now I'll hand you over to our aerial, aerial refueling expert Tim to explain a bit about that system. So the property level is the fact that we don't have a pilot on board and aren't limited by human flight times. We are uh, designing the aircraft with aerial refueling in mind. Um, we've gone with a flying boom system because it requires at least an input from the receiver aircraft uh, as the pilot will be remotely located in this case. But if we moved into different markets where it was required that we have a broken drogue system, this could be modified or just require a more complex call, uh, control mechanism. Basically. Thanks, Tim. Another thing to consider is how we're going to carry the loads from our open station into our main structure of the wing. To do this, we've selected a twin spot, a twin boom layout. This provides the number of advantages, namely being able to select that high tail, which as Matt said, keeps the high exhaust temperatures from the engine away from the tailplane. Also, it gives us two areas with which to retract the um, main landing gear. Um, the booms are sized for that, and do take the back after that short section of housing in order to minimize the excess structural weight. Within the booms themselves, uh, within the booms themselves, we selected a twin spar design to carry the structural loads. This avoids any stress concentrations that we would have experienced were we to use a traditional stress to skin structure and put a cut out in that. One final note is the main landing which has its pivot point forward of the rear spar and hence it has to hinge around the rear spar in order to not violate it. Um, initial estimates of takeoff and landing as well as X-plane simulation we put out a takeoff and landing somewhere below 900 meters. Further work will have to confirm this. However, if this is the case, this is good for our key markets as it gives our key markets in Asia alone nearly 350 airfields from which to operate. What's more, in Brazil and other, another of our key markets, there are over 2,300 runways to operate from. However, about 1,600 of these are on tape. And while the tire pressure was selected to be somewhat durable on these runways, not all of them would be suitable. Um, initial estimates of the range were conducted with a variable lift to drag ratio to get the cruise range of the aircraft. The Arctic ASF is equipped to aerial refuel, and what's more, some of the key markets we're targeting already operate tankers which serves aircraft with inferior range performance of the Arctic ASF. The Arctic ASF can also conduct short range missions in the area of two to three hundred nautical miles without the need for aerial refueling. Um, just lastly, the CG range of the aircraft is primarily used to determine the location of the main landing gear so as not to tip over on rotation or to allow the main to maintain authority for all CG locations. That's about it for the cruise conditions. Now I'll pass you back to Tim and he'll discuss a bit of the design and performance at attack phase. Um, so the LPV SF is designed with an all composite structure essentially. Um, from the two Two spars stress gear wing design with a fairly conventional layout with the spars there and that twin boom tail design that we discussed previously. Now, we've got hard points, uh, precise hard points just inboard and outboard of those booms, as well as one further out on the wing just past the field tanks. Now, as I said, we've gone with an all composite construction because we're selling to military customers who both have experience maintaining airworthiness to such structures and repairing them. Um, and we also have very performance oriented with this day. Now, the wings themselves are made of a carbon dioxide skin and have C section spars within them. The spars themselves are made of two different layouts between the spar webs and the spar caps, um, basically for optimized performance. The booms look rather chunky, and that's because they're sized for control surface deflection to expect to see in combat situations. So very large, very rapid changes in control surface deflections. Since the RPVSF is designed to attack within the enemy as space, it's possible for the aircraft to have some damage during the mission. Some, uh, some damage monitoring system is required in order to detect and estimate the physical damage. ICAW, which is stands for Integrated Caution and Advisory Warning System, is chosen for this task. The system is capable of displaying up to 12 individual messages simultaneously, as well as informing the pilot what the main problem is. 
and additionally, the system also capable of predict predicting the impact of the damage for the future phase of flight. And for the web one targeting system, electro optical targeting system as chosen as the primary system for the aircraft. The system utilizes the infrared signal in order to aim and launch the weapon. The reason that is chosen for the RPSF are that EOTS is designed to provide very precise air to ground attacking with lightweight, durable, and highly affordable. And it is also specially designed for swapping and annual aircraft such as like the RPSF. And I'll pass to Matt to talk about swap integration. Obviously, the RPPSF has been designed to operate in a standalone capacity. However, with the future direction of warfare, we believe that it could easily integrate into swarms. Primarily, how this will be done is by shutting off certain systems and allowing certain aircraft to only utilize that one system. For instance, having one plane with a focus on navigation, one on weapon targeting, and one on weapons deployment. Now, the key advantage of this is that it wouldn't allow for longer insurance missions because the power savings from shutting off certain non key systems we put into increased fuel burn. Furthermore, the RPVSF with the systems on board as we already described has been designed to be able to integrate with both existing manned fighters, current recon UAVs, and possibly even other RPVSFs. So now we've talked about how our aircraft was designed to enable it to complete its mission. Now let's talk about how it actually will carry out this mission with the weapons. <coughs> as Tim touched on before, on the RPVSF, we've got seven hard points. We have three hard points mounted on the outboard section of the wing, as you can see, with one hard point mounted on the center section of the fuselage. This center section mount is mounted directly off the engine frame and is designed to carry us our heaviest payload weapons. The three outboard points are designed to carry slightly smaller weapons, with the out most outboard hard point limited by the size of a weapon and also um, mass of a weapon. However, given the numerous hard points inboard, we don't consider this to be a major issue for the RPPSF. You can also see there some sample payloads for certain missions. Of note is the use of um, potential to carry nuclear armed weapons. This is a key issue in our active patrol and deterrence missions, where the aircraft can stay airborne to maintain a readiness against any credible threat against its operator. The RPVSF, as we've talked about, has been designed to be versatility in mind. It needs to be able to carry out a range of missions with a range of weapons. Key to this is the design of uniform, uniform hard point mounts on craft we have designed for all our hard points to be a uniform joint. Now what this means is that both ejector racks and rails can be fitted to Kratos, which of course means therefore both self-propelled and free-falling weapons could be utilised. Further to this, it also means that the operator can choose how they wish to mount their weapons, adding to Kratos' versatility. We see this is a key point in enabling to carry out a wide range of missions. So now we're going to pass back to Taz, who's going to talk about how we would use our manoeuvrability and control surfaces to carry out our key missions. One of the example missions that we've conducted are the test on the rate of turn of the aircraft. The turn radius of the aircraft is 3 kilometers with 60 degree bank angle to the 2G window. And of course, a higher turn rate can be achieved with the system of elevated deflections. And also in the example mission that we've conducted, the, air, the aircraft was initially at 30,000 feet, which is the cruising attitude. It died. Uh, reached five, uh, three, 5,000 feet, which released bomb and deploy weapons. And after that, it uh, climbed and back up to 30,000 feet. The duration of the entire bombing run was approximately six minutes. So, looking at the cost of such an aircraft, obviously it's been pretty key to its success. Um, we've come up with a unit cost estimated of uh, 39 and a half. Uh, this compares reasonably favorably to other aircraft out there, um, but it should be noted that all of these aircraft we present here have seen cost increases during their program. Now, looking at the JSF as an example, it's seen a 70 percent cost increase, or the global walk has seen a cost increase of about 50 percent since its conception. Um, even with a cost increase in line with those, we would expect it to remain competitive in the current marketplace. The total program cost, including development and prototypes, so on and so forth, the $35 billion is a fairly substantial opportunity. So there you have it, a remote pilot strike fighter known as Kratos. It is a versatile aircraft that has been designed to carry out a range of missions with a range of weapons, capable of a payload of up to 15,000 pounds within a combat radius of approximately 400 nautical miles. Furthermore, with the utilization of aero refueling, it is even capable of staying airborne for a definite amount of times, 
further adding to its versatility. At its unit cost of approximately $40 million, it also comes in cheaper than current, some current combat UAVs and some current strike fighters. Further, this, when compared to other types of weapons, such as cruise missiles, as it is able to carry out multiple missions again and again, it does still represent a cost saving relative to these. Thank you.
uh, how you were optimizing the CF, you know, the index with that CFD uh, profiling, I guess, or, or plot. Now, it, it may have not looked, you know, to my untrained eye, but um, it didn't look to my eye as if it was actually an S. It looked more like it was just a, a crescent. Have you modeled? Uh, yeah, I think it, that may uh, actually, sorry, when we refer to the S-duct, it's the um, top in shape. Yeah, but, I mean, but there has to be another 90 degree bend to get the, the air into the yeah. region, right? Yeah, so that is the, uh, <coughs> the air is in the somewhat forward section, just to show you how The mighty layer kink we found, if you move it further aft, it's uh, more beneficial to help reduce any trochlear. So the second bend is actually comes in there, and that's where it's a very late bend, um, in the second 90 degree bend. Because I think officially it's not done uh, the yeah, I just don't see, I mean, I'm, I'm questioning basically how much of, because uh, I, I cannot see how that second bend is taken into, into the equation and, and whether you can actually bend the air so much in yeah. such a short period of time and not lose. Uh, no, in total we lost, uh, we lost about 4% reduction in velocity, um, which was optimized on these initial designs, showed much, much larger losses in velocity. Um, it is just to show that the airflow can be bent, and there's obviously also a second one there. But uh, if you look on the original uh, wind tunnel model, which used a rough, a, a rough test up design, the second bend is rather late, um, which is where it comes back down a little bit. When you did the model, um, yes, no, so we did model that second bend. I think it's just that visual, uh, it's possible from the wrong angle, but it was a full internal model um, with that out specified pressure outlet and velocity inlet. The last question. Um, just uh, with the uh, fact that we don't have a pilot on board, what is your argument going to be for the senior military people who feel the need for a pilot in this type of application? I think um, we have addressed in our report that the morality issues of needing a pilot to command the aircraft. We're a remote pilot, <coughs> so the pilot would be situated on the ground and control the aircraft from the ground and so thus the primary advantage of it is that it can be sent in combat zones with the risk that it may get shot down which is also a factor in its low cost um, which is part of the primary aim as well. Um, the pilot is on, is on the ground station controlling the aircraft and as we said um, we'll definitely give the go order to deploy weapons. Um, ditto somewhat factor into the cost that you may also require uh, possibly a change of crews if the long movement range mission is being undertaken and also a lawyer for the legality arguments which is uh, in line with current UAV operations. I assume that your data link is still intact. Yes, yeah. Um, and that the situation of awareness <coughs> yeah. is what the people who are not a part of the scene is going to be seen in the future when we do the part because of the long term. Yeah. The situation of awareness is going to be seen in the future. We did consider that obviously um, in the event of a data link loss, that's the primary reason for some of the stability calculations. But we also considered the, uh, the onboard system would you know, realize there's lots of data link, and um, if possible, so assuming it's not in a key phase of attack, for instance, it would fall back to its last kind of waypoint and wait until it re-established the communications. We were quite aware we didn't want to have that moral or legal argument that what happens if it just essentially goes rogue. So we had to factor that into any of um, autopilot system. We need to consider what happens if you've lost communications.